this is the Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer, a dating and makeover expert, where I will help you build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. We are in the process of redefining how we date, communicate, and fall in love. Now, navigating this modern dating world isn't easy, and it's it's like being on a ride with no ending in sight. And as a therapist, I've noticed that the dating fatigue, there's disappointment, anxiety of how to progress, and the sting of rejection even has the most confident daters not immune to the negative effects of dating on a psychological and emotional well-being. And for those of you who struggle with self-worth, these effects can be particularly harmful because you might rely on each click, each like, each validation as almost a dopamine hit for your self-worth. Now, on the flip side, I've seen a lot of positive things come out of this. And I would say positive trends. Online and modern dating trends have also had a big impact on courtship. So what's interesting is that the modern technology has sped up the ability to be introduced to a volume of people. I mean, I feel like that is a huge benefit. But now in this new normal of COVID world, it paradoxically has caused everyone to slow down and learn how to pay attention to things often overlooked or ignored. And I've been saying that it's not exactly a bad thing. I mean, I have clients who are making more of an emotional connection with somebody than they did before this whole thing happened. So I'm sure you've experienced a lot of ups and downs with it all. And that is what I've been helping my clients with. And it's been amazing to hear endless stories of how they've been navigating this new world from parking lot meetings. And by the way, that parking lot meeting that I talked about in my previous podcast is a full-blown relationship right now. I just like, this is hot off the press. I just got a picture of the two of them together. They did end up meeting and they are full on boyfriend and girlfriend. It was a total happy ending. And actually I think I'm going to have her on the podcast soon. So stay tuned for that. And um, I've been hearing things like virtual dances and improv classes online that people are sharing. Uh, And also social distance walking and talking, you know, just to name the few, but you know, we are in this latest kind of modern dating world. And I want to talk about the trends that are happening and the best way to navigate them into healthy, successful relationships without falling into the trap of the wear and tear of the dating fatigue. So I have some super cool women on with me today. I have the perfect people to help me talk about this modern dating stuff, and they know the trends. And we're going to deep dive together and have a really fun conversation on how you can navigate it all. So you are Shu and Julie Craft Chick are the hosts of this amazing podcast. It's called The Dateable Podcast, another top podcast about dating, love, and sex. They talk with real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes. Oh my God, I don't even know what that is. And first moves and first loves. You as a former TV personality and dating coach who has worked with clients all around the world. Julie is a technologist and researcher focused on human connections and relationships. And not only do they have a pulse on dating looks like what it looks like now, but they have authority on what dating will look like in the future amidst of all this crazy stuff happening. Welcome, ladies. Hey. <laughs> Hello, Kimmy. Hi. Do you really want to know what a diaper fetish is? Because we I, can surely yes. go into it. <laughs> okay. Thank you for just like starting there because I actually was going to ask that later on as we warmed up, but I love that you just dove into the diaper. So please, what is that? It's pretty much exactly as it sounds. It's well, there's actually a whole range of fetishes when it comes to diaper fetish. It could be someone who really gets off on seeing their partner in diaper or they get off on themselves wearing adult diapers. Or in the case of the man we interviewed, he really just 
loves seeing his fiance walk around the house in diapers like twice a month, like not every day. He's very reasonable, but he also thinks it's very stress relieving to wear a diaper himself and just change into a diaper after work. You know what the funny part is though, Kimmy, is when you and I got off the phone with him, we were both like, you know, if we met that perfect guy and the only problem was that he wanted to us to throw on a diaper here and there, maybe we'd be down with it. You know, like, there's a lot worse. Oh That's my comfy. God. I like some of you can't see me right now, but my jaw is just kind of like <laughs> dropping. And here I am, a therapist, like, you know, not too many things shock me. And I'd actually love to hop on a call with that guy to see what that's all about. But that's super interesting. But have you ever seen that before or heard that before or just that guy? Well, the funny, the interesting part is that the reason why this all started on our podcast is we had a guest who came to us with a story how she was like propositioned for the diaper fetish. So it was from her perspective. And then we actually had this guest reach out because he heard the episode. So I think that's like one of the things that we've realized is everything kind of comes full circle and no one is alone in their situation in modern living. Oh living. my God. And he went wow. through years of therapy because he wanted to get to the bottom of where this fetish came from and nobody could figure it out. He did. He was not abused as a child. Nothing happened during his childhood. He actually comes from a very normal family. Wow. So he just, he saw a commercial. He remembers seeing a commercial when he was 13 and he was turned on by seeing an adult in a diaper. And it was so, sort of like a funny comedic commercial. They were making fun of a situation. He got turned on by it. And that's very sense from. Wow. I might have to have him on a coaching with Kim episode, but that's just, like, yes. I, I know I digress. Um, okay. I want to hear more about these fetishes and trends and all of that stuff. But before we get into it, I would love to hear like your lady's backstory. Like how did you even get to where you are right now and doing this? Very and good you know, question. Start. I was like, <laughs> We're, we're so polite. We're like, we're we're like, like, we've done this. We've done this story so many times now. We're like, I'll just, I'll let you start, Julie. But uh, <laughs> basically the short of it is Julie and I met through mutual friends when I first moved to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And Julie had been in San Francisco for many, many years. And it was my first time ever living in the city. And we started talking about modern dating, not just about San Francisco dating, but I was dating in New York and Beijing mm -hmm. and LA and comparing the differences. And we both thought, oh my gosh, this would be a fantastic podcast. We have to talk about it because so much is happening in modern dating. So that very same year, we said, let's just try it. Let's, let's put it in audio. Yeah. And just some more background too, is that at the time I had a startup that was like a human connection platform because ah. I had been on dating apps for a long time at that point, And I felt like it was flawed. And I felt like just meeting in real life was really hard this day and age. So I created this company that basically matched people with similar interests over brunch. So it was a way to meet new people in real life. And it actually started as a dating app idea, but it kind of morphed into something bigger to just like bring back the days where you would organically meet. So yeah. I had this interest and then UA was a dating coach in New York and then just all over the world. And we actually met through the mutual friend at one of my events. So we met there the first time, but then we continued to hang out with the mutual friend. And then it kind of evolved into our own friendship. And, you know, as two <laughs> single ladies do, we talked about modern dating all the time and what the fuck was up with it. Can we swear on your podcast? You just did. That. So yeah, I think we're starting a trend <laughs> right here <laughs> on the charisma quotient as you guys bring that element. No, I love it. I love it. Is, that is that charismatic or not is the question. <laughs> it depends, right? Like it depends who you are, how you use it and all that. But that is your, do you, it, it's funny. I had somebody on here who that was her brand, you know, the, that word mm. was in her brand. Yeah. And, and my producers were like, no, we got to replace that because it's saying <laughs> it too many times and it's not charismatic in that way. But when you're saying it, Okay. You know, like in this context, it's fun. So uh, the line is once in a while is charismatic. Yeah. <laughs> once every 20 minutes. <laughs> right. Well, it's like anything, right? Anything in a, in excess can be too much, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, and I think that For goes sure. along with what we probably see with the dating world. I wondered, so like as you ladies were getting into all this together and you were single and all that, have you used like your research 
and just also your observation of all this to help you with your own life. In, oh yeah. In, in relation so to it. Yeah. hundred so. percent. We both, di- <laughs> we date so differently now when we both started the podcast, I feel like, especially for me, I had very strong traditional views about dating and I had rules and I had all mm-hmm. these guidelines for myself. Mm-hmm. And now 10 seasons later of the Dateable podcast, I feel like anything goes and I'm constantly questioning the rules that I have in my head. Yeah. And I think for me, like it was interesting because when we first started the podcast, I was in a relationship and UA was single. I think we've both ebbed and flowed throughout the whole time of being in relationships, out of relationships. I mean, we've been doing this for four years. So in four years, like things are going to happen. And I think for me, it was I always thought everything was about me. Like when I would go on a date and it wouldn't work out, I would think it's like all about me at all times. And I think from doing this podcast, it really helped me understand how people think about dating and that we're all kind of facing the same stuff and people just make crazy interpretations all the time. Like one of our favorite episodes we do is kind of like this, he said, she said perception of a date because you never get feedback on a date. Mm -hmm. And it's always fascinating to hear how two people can have wildly different experiences, expectations, perceptions, all of that. So it's really helped humble myself, I think, especially as I'm dating again. It's like, Uh, it's not all about me. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. You know, I don't know if you know this, but I used to be a matchmaker as well Mm -hmm. in my repertoire of my own journey. And I, I too found that so fascinating because, you know, I would hear different perspectives of the story of their date. And I'd be like, were you guys on the same date? Like (laughs) like they were, they had totally two different views. And I always tell people, because I think a lot of women, and this is what I see with some of my clients, especially ones who are caretakers, Mm -hmm. they're much more readily like to blame themselves for something or take something in Mm -hmm. versus, you know, oh, looking at other things. And what I tell people is that it's not about blaming, you know, Mm -hmm. and you're only 50% of the equation, right? And so these people are going to do what they're going to do, but all you can do is look at what you can do differently to change the result of what you're getting. And that's the empowerment, I think. And that's why I love what you guys are doing because there's a lot of empowerment knowing that, people are really finding things that are challenging all over the world that are similar. And you know what else is fascinating, Kimmy? It's not just women. I think you and I both, we both came in thinking that our listener base would be a hundred percent women. And we thought that women and men would have drastically different challenges when it came to dating. Mm -hmm. And our listener base is like 60, 40. It's still like a little skewing women, but it's still way more men than we thought. And their challenges are almost identical. Like it's crazy how different Mm -hmm. it's become. Oh my God. I'm so glad you said that because my men are always surprised to hear that the women get coached and, and same vice versa. Like men Mm -hmm. are like, you coach women. Like, what do you ladies have to worry about? You know, (laughs) it's fascinating. I know men just think women don't need any help. And then we're just sitting ducks waiting for all these men to come to us. And they feel like we get all these matches on dating apps and we, we spend most of our time trying to figure out who to go on a date with. And that (laughs) is not the fairy tale that they think it is. You know, it's, so it's one of those things you I always, and I always say, it's like, where is the mismatch though? Because we hear of all these women wanting serious relationships, all these men wanting serious relationships, but for whatever reason, they cannot find each other or mm-hmm. they don't like each other. And I think there's, it's very fascinating. Well, let's get into that because I am interested in kind of the the stuff that you're finding that's out there in relation to that. Like, what are some of the gender differences that you're seeing in this modern world? Like, are there? Yeah, I know there's commonalities, but are there differences? I think the, one of the biggest differences is that they, we always assume the other gender is going through something different than what we're going through. Mm. So what we end up doing is we make excuses for the other gender, Mm -hmm. whether it's, oh, I think he is experiencing societal pressure or she is experiencing professional pressure. For some reason, we keep making excuses for each other versus actually communicating with each other and saying, how can we come to an agreement about this? 
And this is the main problem we see a lot with modern dating is that people just don't give each other enough time because we they make all these assumptions, mm -hmm. we, they make all these excuses up front, they ignore the red flags, and they think one date, if we don't feel the chemistry or I don't feel like we could we ha could have a future together, then adios, we're done. And that's not how a strong relationship is formed. A relationship is formed over time. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a difference too is that it's really fascinating time actually for gender roles that we've gone through. It's like it women have been evolving over these years. We've been kind of told to go after things and make the first moves. And there's even studies that like men like the first move. And we actually just did a episode on our podcast about a woman proposing and we the some of the stats it's still only like five percent so it's one of those things that even though in theory everyone's saying do it and we want it and more women are doing it it's still not the total norm and i think that's been fascinating is that there's still this like like straddle between the traditional and the new way of thinking a lot especially for women that are like probably like 35 plus right that we've like been in like this both UA and I are what we call elder millennials like we're in our <laughs> late 30s and yeah. you know we straddle just this new way of thinking but just the stuff that's been put in our heads for so long and it's really tough to break out of that sometimes so I think women definitely struggle with that a bit more and then men also struggle with it but in different ways like for example when the check comes like they still know that women kind of expect them to pay but then also they make potentially less than women nowadays like there's just so much confusion in general and also like men have always been told to be a certain way and there's been not as much fluidity as women have had. So there's this whole like remaking masculinity and what does it mean to be a man today? And I think men are really just going through that now whereas women, we've started going through that a couple years ago. Oh my, I'm really glad we're talking about this because I, I would say this is such a hot topic with all my clients that I work with, men, women from 16 all the way up to 85. It doesn't matter. There, there's this, you know, kind of like you, you said, you're straddling of, of both, you know, worlds almost because in the modern day world, I think there's different expectations also than how it was back in the day before women worked even. Mm -hmm. And so are there any statistics or just trends that you're seeing in how like women and men are navigating that, like, like the roles, like the traditional roles. It's such a seesaw effect because mm. what we hear from a lot of women is a chip on their shoulder. I think a lot of women have this narrative in their mind. I work this hard to get to this level in my career. I'm super independent. I can go after anything I want. So why can't I find a man that deserves me? But then when it comes to male, female gender roles, if a, if a man is not manly enough or is the mm -hmm. aggressor or making the first move, then the woman's like, well, you should be, you should be the one, you should be the man in the situation. The man's like, I actually don't know what message you're trying to give me. Are you, are you saying you're independent? You can go after whatever you want. Um, you can take control of your life, yet you still want me to do certain things for you without you asking. So then the, the men are kind of like, okay, do I step back? Do I come, do I, you know, give you, give you a little bit here or take back a little bit. And then the women, I think, again, beyond all of this, the other chip on the shoulder is why have we assumed so many freaking roles? We've, mm -hmm. we are the mother, the um, caregiver. We are the housekeeper. We are everything right now. We are the career woman. And we're just freaking exhausted. In the words of Ali Wong, I just want to lie down, right? We just want yeah. to lie down. We're so exhausted <laughs> looking for a partner who can just take over some of the responsibilities. But for some reason, a lot of us just don't have the tools to communicate those needs. Yeah, yeah. I think what else is really interesting too, it's, again, it comes back to this like straddling new and old. It's like men still have this like feeling that I want a relationship once I get my, like once I'm on a good path in life, like once I can be a provider, once I have a job that I'm happy with and I like pays the bills well and I can support a family, like all mm -hmm. of this stuff, like that old tradition hasn't gone away completely, even though it 
it's it's hard. I mean, like in our especially like millennial generation too, even younger. It's like we've been through so many recessions at this point, and now we're in another one, right? And it's really hard for people to potentially get to that place where they can be financially safe and sound. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's like, are you going to wait forever for things to be perfect? What? over like just go in dive into a relationship and work together and I think women are much better multitaskers than men like we can get our career in order have a relationship like all this happens simultaneously where men are very singular focused so we've seen a lot of stories we had experts on our show too that talk about like how the man will meet like Miss Wright but it's it's still not gonna work because they're not where they need to be right now and we've seen that as a trend more and more, especially with men, but even women, it's like, I need to get me in order first and I date yeah. me first. I love this conversation because, you know, I, I've been talking a lot about where I almost feel like we're in a state of recalibration, you know, it's like mm. the pendulum effect, you know, I think we were once over, you know, all the way over here and then we had to swing all the way to the other side and that's not good either. So it's almost somewhere in between and we're all mm -hmm. trying to figure out what that looks like and, and really what makes sense in terms of even attraction in the roles right. that we play out. And really the answer lies within, and this is why, so I, I can't tell you how many flirt workshops I've been doing more and more lately. Really, so much of the answer lies within flirtation. And I think just even understanding what flirtation is and being in your feminine without losing that that independence, because I think women also think like, oh my gosh, if I flirt, then oh, you know, I'll be seen as dumb and that, you know, okay. I can do it. I don't of that, the, that I can do it kind of attitude. And so I always say like both genders have responsibility and approachability. Yeah. And it's oh, yeah. what you guys said is so true is that we're each blaming each other. But if we take a look at our responsibility as a woman and as a man, how can we like work in this new world so yeah. that we come together? Because otherwise no one's meeting anyone to your point. And, and I think, it's... oh, you want to go first? Go for it. Okay, I think what's really great right now is that women have the femininity that they've always had, right? But we're also embracing more masculinity. Yes. Tricks, right? Like we're going after things. We're not sitting passive. And that's all really great qualities. And I think actually with this whole re redefinition of manhood, it's allowing men to also access their feminine side, which is great because that's why men have like built up so much like anger and just you know, just outlets that aren't productive. And it's great that we're making this more socially acceptable that you can have both. But I think to your point, Kimmy, it's like, how do we work together to balance both? Because if we don't have some of that, there's just going to be no attraction. Like there's exactly, like, yeah, like the principles of attraction haven't gone away completely. But we, it's a good thing too, though, because we don't want just for example, for women, we don't want men that have no emotions. Like we do want both, but we also want to feel protected and attracted to our men too. So it's, it's, yeah, it's tough to navigate. It's a problem when we're at a stalemate. That's the problem because we feel like when it comes to dating, who can show the least interest wins first. Mm -hmm. And that's not yeah. how <laughs> this war is won yes. because it's not a war. So I kind of equate it to any wedding reception where if it's always like the drunk guy that gets on the dance floor first and the drunk bridesmaid, right? And those are the two <laughs> people who start the party because they have no shame. And then they're just like, let's just, let's just get this dance started. But for everybody else, they're just trying to be the last one on the dance floor because for some reason, pride is keeping them from getting there. But to get into a relationship, you have to do the yeah. dance first. So we have to think about like, how do we get out of this stalemate and for both parties to make little moves towards each other? You know, I, this reminds me, cause I literally just got off the coach, like a coaching session with a client and often I'll go into people's like Bumble accounts and I, I get really meta with them and I'm like, I, things aren't progressing on Bumble. I'm like, great. Just let's pull up your profile and see what's happening. And it's not until I lift the hood 
you know, so to speak, I start seeing a lot of things that are like dysfunctional. Um, And so what was happening is she was not getting asked out at all. Like this had to do with approachability online. And I think it's really important to talk about because that's where we are right now. Like, how do you progress in the virtual world? You know, we Mm -hmm. we can't go to a dance anymore or at a bar. So, um, you know, this, this woman, all she was doing was she just kept asking questions and she was like interrogating this guy right and Mm. then she wasn't hinting at all that she wanted to like see him or being playful or flirtatious I literally thought I was reading a LinkedIn exchange like that's how bad it was Mm. yeah and this is it's hard now too because men aren't always making that first move anymore because of just like everything with me too also it's like a lot of men are just very timid at this point so I think just like the best way to get things going and this is something I did in real life when we can meet in real life but we got this advice from our podcast too it's like exchange at least three things about someone like learn three Mm -hmm. solid facts about them because you don't those people that just go in hot and are like let's meet up or even nowadays let's video chat when you haven't done anything it's too much but you also don't want to be in this extensive I'm going to chat with you like text black call right yeah so yes we think it's good to do this three it doesn't have to be three verbatim, like around three though. It's like enough that you get a feel of this person. Like you can even ask just basic questions of where are you from? Like, you know, like, like very basic stuff to get the ball rolling. And then I think like what I would do in the past is just say, Hey, like, I'd love to continue this conversation, like through text, just to get it off the app and then move it forward. Or you could even say like, hey, I'd love to like continue this conversation on FaceTime or on the video chat. And even a lot of dating apps today are creating video chat right within there if you're not ready to give your personal number. So there's so many yes. options to move it along. Those are that those are great suggestions. And I want to say too, is that a lot of women, I don't know if you're seeing this too trending, is that they they don't know the difference between being aggressive and assertive versus flirtatious. Mm, right. And so like the other day, there was somebody who wanted to go on a Zoom call or even listen to his voice because it was a black hole for sure. They kept texting over and over again. And she wanted to say, you know, well, let's move this or let, let's go to a Zoom date. And, and she, was, she was saying it so that it was almost like a business exchange. Mm. And I said, but what if you said instead, you know, I wonder what your voice sounds right. like. Oh. Like that's different. Like that's dropping the hanky and still t- getting it to the next level without oh, yeah. being the aggressor. So I think that's also like important conversation. Absolutely. I, or like one of the really things, good. if it was like in real life meeting, what I would used to do is like, if you're talking for a bit and you're like, Hey, like, it seems like we're really jiving. Like, I feel like this could be a good conversation in person. So we're not like texting with it. So it's, moving it along, but it's not su- seeming super eager also. Right, right. There is a fine line. I totally agree with you, Kimia, around aggression, assertiveness, and also flirtatiousness. We had a member on our Facebook group the other day post this dilemma she had. She finally mm. met up with this guy that she'd been chatting with. And after spending a day with each other and a sleepover, she was joking about that he better call her the next day. Just joking. And he, he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he never called her the next day. So she wanted to get some advice from the men in the group. And a lot of the men were saying, well, if you joke about it, I don't know if right. you're serious. Yeah. You know, that's not, that's not a hint to me. That's more, are you joking because you don't want to talk to me tomorrow? Or are you being demanding? I don't really know. So it's sort of confusing, but it would be nicer. Like, what, what do you think would be a, a more flirtatious way of getting him to call her the next day? Well, you know, you're right. And and I say all the time, like, men really need directives. Like we women can read subtexts, right? With mm. each other. Cause I think we're socialized that way, to be honest, it yes. is to almost be indirect versus yeah. direct. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So that's our language. And so we can really like get messages underneath it where men do not get that. No, but I think it's also, it's not just what you say, it's how you deliver it as well. Mm, And so it's the tonality, it's the playfulness in your voice. Cause 
like to your point, like that delivery of that line could have been effective had it been with a little wink and a smile and a little flirtatious right. with it and be like, no, seriously, like I would love to hear your voice. And that means yes. like, what do you right. think about a call? Wink, wink, you know, like instead of saying, well, how about if we move this to a call? I'm available Wednesday at 5 p.m. Like that's <laughs> like a business transaction. Yeah, right. right. And then ending that with ha ha, LOL, just kidding. LOL. <laughs> and then they're just like, Gee, <laughs> I mean, I think also one of the things that we've heard from men over and over again that women are still hesitant to do is just like at the end of a date or even at the end of a video date, it could just be like, I had a really good time. Like I really enjoyed meeting you or hanging out with you. And a lot of women are like, well, that sounds really over eager. And it's mm -hmm. not, if you say it, you're just giving someone permission to make the next move, especially in a world today where men are a little hesitant to make that next move. Yes, yes. And and I think both genders struggle with the ending on dates. Oh, and yeah. this is another oh, yeah. that's an and this is another opportunity for the flirtation piece too, is that, you know, I always say you don't have to be so literal either. Like you could no. still be playful in the in the follow-up as well. So even using the conversation that night and then taking it to the next place. So remember when we were talking about chocolate, you said that you had that place that you wanted to take. Yeah. I'm really curious about that place, you know, kind of mm -hmm. thing and, mm -hmm. and see how that, you know, feels, but you're right. Like any, a, a man needs that assurance that, Hey, I like you and I want to see you again somehow. Right. You right. Know? So, so they're not like a harasser, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think also though, it's like, yeah. we say like people are always just playing relationship, relationship chicken right now. Like no one wants to show <sighs> that they are more invested than the other person. I actually think that is the biggest downfall, downfall of modern dating today because it just leaves both people ambiguous and no one's, that excited about it and when there's like a lukewarm feeling it's almost worse than a terrible date mm -hmm. or an yeah. amazing date right I mean obviously amazing date is the best situation but <laughs> like I think it's I, worse than the lukewarm date because you're just like yeah. eh, I could take it or leave it and then usually you end up leaving it because other things come in the way yeah. so when someone goes that extra mile to tell you they had a really good time or whatever that may be it might actually make something that was lukewarm bring it to the surface and yeah. make it something that you you pursue and then chemistry grows over time opposed to oh I didn't feel an immediate spark it was okay but I'm not going to pursue it anymore yes yes I love that you just said relationship chicken like that's a really <laughs> good that's a really good term Wait, are there some other terms that are kind oh, yeah. of like hot right now that I'd love to go over that because it keeps changing especially right now we had a new one that popped up. We did a whole episode on it. Zumping. Dumping Zumping? Zoom. Yes, that's a hot one. Yep. So I made Dumping up a new one. Zoom. Oh, my God. Okay. I made up a new one the other day. Because, you know, like, um, when you've been you've been with like you've been out without sex for a long time oh yes and you're like in um oh my god now I'm blanking on it <laughs> it was like and by the way that's another thing that everyone is struggling with like people who are oh isolated yeah right now and not being able to touch anybody like that is a big thing we did a oh whole yeah episode on virtual sex and phone sex which so is that yeah. really happening oh, oh yeah, yeah. All but I was, the sex play, play parties, sex parties are taking their events online and they're selling out like crazy. Totally. So but I think one thing that's coming back, this yeah. is the term I coined just now. Oh, it's, good. Instead of slump buster, because that's like been like if you've been a little in a dry spell and you finally find someone that you'll have sex with to break the dry spell. I think one of the things that people need mm -hmm. to be wary of is the quarantine buster, because it's like we've all been in quarantine for like three months and if you're single mm -hmm. and haven't had any like long-term prospects or anyone that you've been with you might like I think there's a chance that someone might fall victim if they think that something's going a certain way where the other person's intentions might just be to like get out of that slump so oh yeah mm. good point that's a really good point Wait, with the, okay, so I'm still like fixated on the sex party. So what, <laughs> I'm just trying to like understand. So like, do, do, what do Zoom bombers do in a sex party? Cause I mean, you're already, they're already having a sex party. Does that like, what, how does that even work? Is it, is it like a group thing or? 
Yeah, it's different variations. It could be a sex centered show. So there could be a strip Mm -hmm. tease happening. It could be group Um, activities. So everybody strip at the same time or everybody play this exotic Exo- erotic game exotic and erotic <laughs> exotic <game>. and erotic <laughs> <laughs> but it you know the rule is everyone has to participate you can't be that perverted lurker with your video off and you're oh. on mute everybody has to be an equal participant and that's what makes these events really successful but they've they've been really popular yeah and yeah. it can be anything to like doing something a little more pg like sharing sexy stories to full out orgies and people like masturbating at home. So it can go really extreme, but then we've also just, we had someone on our podcast that does like art of virtual sex and like sex, uh, phone oh. sex workshops. So he just like teaches people about how to really engage in phone sex. Cause it's something that can be a little intimidating if you've never done mm-hmm. it before, yeah. but the way he was describing it, it's just, there's so much sensuality with it. Like having someone's voice in your ear. Like if you're like, away from them right now and you're on your bed laying down and you have someone's voice in your ear there's something really that gives a lot of closeness to that and he also said it doesn't need to be like full-on sex immediately it can just be um, I want to hold you right now or I'm okay. imagining myself kissing you it doesn't need to be like mm-hmm. go <laughs> intimacy you know that's interesting because to me that's almost um synonymous of what I'm seeing with emotional connection now in, Mm -hmm. in ways that it's forcing people to, to slow down and also giving people permission to do some stuff like this, where maybe they always wanted to work on their sex life and how to give themselves pleasure or even work on just, you know, feeling better about their body. And because they're not in the physical world, getting caught up in all that, it gives them this almost permission. I I don't know how else to put it. It's very interesting. Yeah. That's what he was saying that even once we're out of quarantine, like, I mean, first of all, sex parties probably aren't going to happen for a very long time because that's like (laughs) the epitome of a lot of people touching each other. But he sees that virtual sex parties and just virtual sex will continue even past the point of that we can be with people again, just Mm because it does provide another outlet, like you were just saying, Kimmy, that lets people just engage with themselves more, engage in like fetishes. Maybe you have that secret diaper fetish. Bring that to the table, right? This is your opportunity to test it out. Not being judged at all. I right? see her ordering on Amazon right now. Some oh my god! Order. I'm going to be going on your show, and you're going to see like a diaper on my head. <laughs> like, oh my god, Kimmy, just like really. Yeah. Um, I so one last like trends that I was interested in. Do, do you have any statistics or just things that you're noticing about the different generations? Mm. Statistics wise, we, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we've done an episode on Gen Zers and mm-hmm. how different they are. So it feels like we're going back towards the traditional. It really feels like Gen X and millennials were the ones that went a little crazy yeah. and really experimented with non-traditional lifestyles, really like thought outside the box. And Gen Zers saw all this happening and thought, I really like the way my grandparents do things. <laughs> it seems safer. It seems simpler. I think mm. I just want to go to simpler times. So the statistics we've been seeing is that they delay relationships because they actually believe in lasting relationships. Uh, they they really believe in dating one person at a time. So they don't really believe in the hookup culture. They're not sleeping around as much. In fact, there's a sex drought with Gen Zers. And they just really, I think they value human relationships and connections much more. So, uh, you know, the, the research we've done, Gen Zers feel like if you meet someone that's not online, like you met them in person, that's, that's like a unicorn relationship that you hold on to. I think too, just all what you just said is going to start to trickle to all the generations with COVID, right? It's Mm -hmm. like, we are going, the hookup culture is going to die because people are going to be worried about germs now, right? There's like more stuff. You're not going to just hook up with any last person from Tinder. You're going to 
be on video calls a lot more and vet a lot more people and probably really just pursue one person at a time again. So I think a lot of the traditional will come back from COVID-19 just because of the scare and just the way things are netting out. But I also think this time in quarantine has really shown like the value of monogamous relationships. Like we've oh, even talked yeah. to polyamorous couples that are now quarantined with one partner who was so anti-monogamy that are like, actually, this is pretty good. Like there's a value here. Or again, just for the safety reasons, like they might just not be pursuing it as much as they once were. So I think just regardless of your age, that trend is going to come back. Mm-hmm. And we find our listeners, like we have a lot of people, we kind of have like a few different groups of people. We have like the people that are very new to relationships, like maybe they're in their early 20s or they're just like late bloomers in their 30s, like very little relationship history. But then we also have this cohort of people that are divorced and they're back out there and this is their Mm -hmm. first time dating and they've never done online dating and dating apps before. And honestly, the differences between the groups are not all that different, which is fascinating. There's more like life experience for the second cohort and relationship experience. But then the benefit of the first cohort is they're kind of like fresh, like they don't have any biases in any way. So it's fascinating. There's definitely similarities and differences, but I think there's even more similarities between generations than you would ever expect. Wow. Well, I guess the bottom line, it's like how we started, we're we're all really not that different, you know, men, women, different ages, you know, I think we all want the same thing fundamentally. And that is that love that we're seeking. And it starts with ourselves. And I think this is a time that we're we're able to do that. And I think because of that, we're going to attract something better. And we'll, I think that we're actually going to come out even better than we were before. I really believe that because of a lot of the stuff that you're saying. Well, ladies, I could literally talk to you forever. I was just like, oh my God, this is so fun. Maybe we'll do a part two at some point. Um, Do you have any like last words of wisdom or stories you want to share? And then please let us know how we can find you. I would just say exactly what you just said. I think the silver lining of this entire situation is putting us in the same boat and knowing that we're all in this together and seeing all the similarities versus all the differences. So when we come out of this, it's no longer me versus you when it comes to modern dating. It's how can we get through this world and create a life together, which is a much better way of building a relationship. I think we need to remember that we all used to complain about dating. Like that's part of why we have a podcast is there's been so many dating horror stories and all this stuff. And I don't think we should go back to the way it was. Like, why is that what we want to do when it was something that we were just complaining about? I think what's really nice about this situation, by no means am I saying COVID-19 was a good thing overall, like definitely wish it didn't happen. But Mm -hmm. if it's happening, we might as well make the best of the situation. And I think we can take the parts of dating that were working, but then reinvent the parts that weren't. So let's make that new normal into something that we actually want, because I would think that actually more men and women do want the same thing and more different people of different generations want the same thing. And then just where you can find us, um, really on every podcast player, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Overcast, pretty much anything. And then just datablepodcast.com and at datablepodcast on Instagram. Oh, awesome. I can't thank you enough for coming on. This was so fun and informative. And I really, I do feel like it gave a sense of normalcy, you know, just what we're all going through and, and having that support. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. This was so fun. This has been the Charisma Quotient. And I am your host, of course, Kimmy Seltzer. Remember, you can build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. And make sure you go to my site, KimmySeltzer.com. And if you're finding yourself having a hard time navigating this modern dating thing and want to know more, click the link in the show description. I'd love to get on a call with you and just see how I can help map out a plan for you. It's not easy, especially if it's all new for you. It starts with a call. So stay tuned until next week with more tips on how to feel and look fabulous every day.